just brushing my hair. Ow. Mm -hmm. Hi honeys, I'm Megan and welcome to my channel. So I have always been fascinated with spooky things, serial killers, and my family loves paranormal stuff. We watch all the shows and I mean, that's kind of weird to be fascinated with, but here I am making this channel to satisfy all of your spooky needs. So on this channel, I will be talking a lot about true crime, a lot about the paranormal, and of course I will be throwing in everyone's favorite conspiracy theories. And these videos are going to be a little long and some of them are going to be pretty gross with a lot of details. So if you get sick easily or just don't eat before watching some of my videos, I'll warn you before. But especially this one, my first one, we're going with a bang. Um, it's gross, but it's pretty interesting. It is fascinating, but also really disturbing. Let's get spooky. So today we'll be talking about Richard Trenton Chase, otherwise known as the Vampire of Sacramento. So he was born on May 23rd, 1950 in Sacramento, California. So when he grew up, his lifestyle, his parents were pretty strict. They fought a lot. He was beaten. He would torture and abuse different animals, different stray cats, dogs, squirrels, that kind of stuff. But a lot of his classmates growing up, a lot of people in his life, they never thought anything else was really off. And then he gets into high school and he starts drinking, he gets into drugs, and things start to get a little worse when he starts dating. So when he starts dating, he had a physical problem where he just could not get and hold an erection. So in his mind, he thought, okay, so my blood should be rushing there, but it's not. So he thought that by supplementing the blood with blood from other animals, that would get him an erection. So that was his train of thought. And so he grew up, he graduated from high school. So he moved out of his house and he moved into an apartment with roommates and he just kept cycling through roommates because no one wanted to live with him. He was really bizarre and they all said he was a nice guy but had these weird tics about him and things were off so it just didn't go well. So he ended up moving back home with his mom but he thought that his mom was trying to poison him so then he left again. So at this point he's living by himself in an apartment and he becomes obsessed with his health and his body. He thinks so many things are wrong with him. One time he entered an emergency room saying that someone stole his pulmonary artery. In 1976 Richard was hospitalized with blood poisoning from injecting himself with blood from a rabbit. Richard didn't think that he was suffering from blood poisoning. He thought that the rabbit drank battery acid and the battery acid seeped into Richard's stomach. He thought that bones were sticking out of the back of his neck. He thought that his heart would just randomly stop beating. Uh, he thought his stomach was backwards and upside down and he thought that his blood would turn to powder. In his mind, he thought that the only way to stop his blood from turning into powder was to drink blood and eat organs from other animals. He would take animals, he would eat them raw, he would blend their organs up with blood or just drink the blood. Very gross, but in his mind, it was how he was fixing himself. He was put in a mental institute. The psychiatrist diagnosed him as a paranoid schizophrenic. They thought he could also be suffering from drug-induced toxic psychosis. He escaped from that mental institute, and in 1976, he was put into Beverly Manor, another mental institute. And this is the place where he got nicknamed Dracula. And that was because he would always talk about his diet and how he would drink blood and all this stuff. And one time they found him with blood all around his mouth and two dead birds outside his window. So all this was going on at Beverly Manor. And the great psychiatrist there and all the doctors, they released him because they did not think he was a danger to himself or to anyone else. So after he was released from Beverly Manor, he moved into his own apartment and immediately started torturing animals again. One time Richard stole his neighbor's dog, murdered it, and mutilated it in order to drink the blood and eat the organs. And then once the family reported their dog missing, he called the family to tell them what he did to their dog. That's really disturbing. Can you imagine your dog's missing and then someone calls you to tell you that they mutilated your dog and drank their blood and ate their organs. One time his mother walked into his apartment and saw him ripping apart a cat and rubbing the blood all over his face and she did absolutely nothing. She did not report it. She just basically just left and didn't say anything about it. 
that's great parenting right there. So then Richard bought guns and he started practicing with them and he became extremely fascinated with the Hillside Strangler which uh, was a serial killer in his neighborhood also going on around this time so he would always read articles and collect all these different news clips and all that kind of stuff. First time that the police interacted with Richard was on August 3rd, 1977. Police officers found Richard's truck stuck in sand near Pyramid Lake in Nevada. When they got to the car, there was no one in it, but they found two rifles on the seat. There was blood smeared everywhere, and there was a bucket, a white plastic bucket, full of blood, and it had a liver in it. So the cops were very suspicious. They, of course, assumed that it was human blood and a human liver. So they began to search the area, and they found Chase naked standing on rocks and once Chase saw the police he immediately ran but the police caught up to him and they arrested him. He told the police that the blood was his and it just seeped out of him. The police ran tests and the blood and the liver actually came from a cow so the police just released him with no charges. So this leads into the first murder he committed. It was on December 29, 1977. Ambrose Griffin was 51, and him and his family were carrying in groceries from their car. And it was in the middle of the day, and Ambrose was bringing a bag in, and he collapsed. So his wife originally thought, you know, it was a heart attack or maybe a stroke, something just really random. But turns out, Chase really just drove by and shot him in the back. There was no real leads to this because the cops just assumed it was a thrill kill. It was just maybe a teenager driving by. Neighbors said they saw a man with a rifle in the neighborhood, but that didn't really lead to anywhere. They did find bullet casings down the street, and so that was the only piece of evidence that they had. Before he killed his next victim, people in Sacramento had a few encounters with Chase that they, at the time, didn't know who he was or what was going on, but now they look back and a lot of people came out and reported all these different things. A lot of people in this neighborhood reported a man prowling and walking around in their backyard and breaking into their house. In January of 1978, a family came home and interrupted Chase while he was breaking into their house. So they chased him out of the house, they didn't catch him, they didn't really see much, but their house was completely disheveled and Richard urinated in a drawer of baby clothes and defecated on a child's bed. Everyone in this neighborhood, they're all having weird encounters with this man but no one really connects it police don't really know what's going on and then on january 23rd 1978 teresa whalen was 22 years old and she was three months pregnant so before entering the house chase put bullets in the mailbox and these were the same bullets that were found a street away from where ambrose griffin was murdered so this was the only connection that the police made between the first murder and this murder as teresa was taking out the garbage Chase ran into her and shot her twice. He shot her once in the palm. She was kind of like defending herself or trying to in her best way. Then he shot her again in the head. And once she collapsed, he went to her again and shot her in the temple. Chase then dragged her into the bedroom, leaving a trail of blood. He then grabbed a knife from the kitchen and an empty yogurt container from the trash that she was taking out. So her husband David came home at 6 and the house was completely dark. When he entered, the stereo was on, which was pretty odd to him. What he thought was oil stains led a trail to the bedroom, so he followed the trail and that's when he found his wife who was mutilated and murdered. So Teresa was on the floor in the bedroom. She was almost naked and her legs were wide open, which made the police think that this had something to do with sexual assault or someone tried to rape her and molest her in some kind of way. This is where it gets really disturbing and gross, and this is where the police, after this whole investigation, made the connection between what Richard was doing to animals, he was doing the exact same things to humans. Her stomach was cut open and her spleen and intestines were pulled out of her body. So Chase had stabbed her repeatedly in the lungs, the liver, her diaphragm, and in her left breast. He also cut out her kidneys and cut her pancreas in half. He then put both of the kidneys actually back into the body. There's blood in the bathroom, and it was later learned that Chase filled up the empty yogurt container with blood, went into the bathroom, and smeared it all over his face and his arms, and was licking it off of his fingers. Blech. That's not a pretty picture. Ew. There are also odd rings of blood around her body, uh, so the police assumed that there were buckets or something surrounding her body. 
which was later learned that he would drain her of her blood or take as much blood as he could, fill it up in this bucket, and that's what he took with him to go. So after this murder, the police did not have any leads. They did make these connections between the first murder and this murder, but they still had no leads as to who was doing it. On January 27, 1978, two days after Teresa Whalen was murdered, a puppy was found killed and mutilated not far from the Whalen home. A, a family recognized this dog and told the police that a man with stingy hair is what they said, bought two puppies and one of the one of the puppies from the litter was actually the dead puppy that they found. But the police still didn't have a name, they still didn't have a clear description of the man, so they really had nothing to go off of. This leads into Chase's final murders. On January 27th of that same year, Evelyn Miroth, who was 38, was babysitting her two-year-old nephew David, her five-year-old son Jason, and her 51-year-old friend Dan Meredith came over to help. Jason was supposed to have a play date with a little girl in the neighborhood, but he never showed up, so the neighbors went to the house and that's when they found the dead bodies. They called 911 and the police came, so when they entered the house they saw Dan Meredith, the 51-year-old friend, he was dead in the hallway, laying in a large pool of blood. The deputy saw that he was shot in the head. So as the deputy kept walking to the house, he saw blood in the bathroom. He said it looked like bloody water in the tub, but there were no bodies found in the bathroom. Evelyn was found lying in her bed. She was naked and her legs were open, which was very similar to how they found Teresa. She had a gunshot wound to her head and her stomach was cut open and her intestines were pulled out. So what appeared to have happened was that Evelyn was taking a bath when Chase came in, surprised her, attacked her, killed her, and then dragged her to the bedroom. He sodomized her, stabbed her through the anus, into her uterus at least six times. He made several slices around her neck and tried but failed to cut out one of her eyeballs. There were more rings of blood that were found around her body, once again indicating that Chase used a bucket to put blood in again, just like he did with Teresa's body. So this gets worse when the police discover next to her body, the body of her five-year-old son, Jason. Jason was shot in the head twice. David, the two-year-old nephew, was missing from the scene of the crime. But in his crib, there was a lot of blood. So the police were really concerned and they knew they had to move as fast as they could to try and find the child, hoping that he was still alive. As the police were investigating all these murders, they were trying to come up with a profile of who the killer could possibly be. They determined from the start that this killer was not very organized and just focused on themselves. Basically saying that the killer had a job they wanted to get done. They did it and then they left without thinking of what they were leaving behind. So in the last murders, Chase was interrupted by the neighbors coming looking for Jason, who was supposed to be at the play date. So he left as fast as he could. He had the baby with him, he took David with him, he left bloody footprints and a few handprints at the scene of the crime. So this was huge when the police were trying to determine who the killer was. During the investigation, one of the hardest things was that these victims were not related to each other in any way. And a lot of times serial killers choose their victims wisely. They have something very specific about their victims that they want. The way that Richard chose his victims was very random. And he told the FBI that the way he chose his victims was by going door to door in neighborhoods. And if the door was locked, that meant he wasn't welcome. But if it was unlocked, that meant he was welcome to enter. And so he did. That's how he chose his victims was if the door was unlocked. So many neighbors, and specifically a girl that went to high school with Richard, recognized these sketch drawings, recognized what different people were saying about what this man looked like. And they were finally able to put together that it was Richard Chase. They arrested Richard in January of 1978. So once they arrested him, they went into his apartment and it was very evident that he was the murderer. There was a lot of buckets full of blood. There were dirty, bloody rags everywhere. So I'm not going into a lot of detail because it is very, 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 very gross and disturbing. So if you want to learn more, go ahead and search it up. That's all you. There was a blender full of organs that he would blend up, drink that, and he would mix a lot of his blood and organs with Coca-Cola to drink that. So months later in March, they finally found David's body. It was in a box in the alley. What was determined that happened was Richard shot baby David 
when he was in his crib and then took David with him and then decapitated him and drank his blood and removed some of his organs as well. So the trial began on January 2nd, 1979. He was charged with six counts of murder. He was found guilty and sentenced to death by gas chamber. So while he was in jail waiting to receive his punishment, the inmates did not like him and they taunted him and they tried to convince him to commit suicide. December 26, 1980, Richard Trenton Chase overdosed on drugs and was found dead in his cell. So that is Richard Trenton Chase, the Vampire of Sacramento, and all the awful stuff that he did. There are so many unanswered questions about Richard Chase. For example, why was he not punished for what he did to the animals? When he was found with the cow's blood and liver in the bucket, why didn't the police do something more about it? I mean, there's blood smeared all over the car, all over himself. There's rifles in the seat, and the police just said, okay, this man's fine, let him go. And this leads into why did the doctors at Beverly Manor let him go? If he was talking about his diet, if he was found with blood on his mouth from two dead birds outside of his window, why did the doctors think that he was not a danger to himself or anyone else. It's awful what he did to all of his victims, but why did he only mutilate the women and the child? Was there something special about their blood or their organs? Was there something in them that was important to Richard? Or was it just people being in the wrong place at the wrong time? Does that also play into his fascination with choosing his victims the way he just walked up to people's houses and if the door was locked or unlocked that would determine who he was going to kill. And then what triggered him to go from animals to humans and for all of this to escalate so quickly? Going back to Ambrose, why did he just drive by and shoot him? Was he trying to test if he was capable of killing humans? So if he was testing if he was capable of killing humans, this goes into more questions about his emotions and his mental state. Did his fixation on his health and his body overpower his emotional attachments to other people? Just psychologically, what happened to Richard Trenton Chase? What happened in his childhood to make him want to do this? Or was he born this way? Let me know if you have any ideas to answering these questions. I hope you guys enjoyed or were at least fascinated or I don't know what the right word to say for this kind of stuff is. But I hope you guys enjoyed this spooky video. And let me know if there's any true crime stories, paranormal stories, conspiracy theories, or anything that you want me to talk about on this channel. I really want to hear from you what you want to see from me. See so here from. Anyways, just tell me what you want to see. Thank you guys so much for watching my video. I hope you enjoyed getting spooky with me. Please subscribe to my channel and give this video a thumbs up. I hope you had a spooky time and I'll see you soon. Bye honeys! Who is dead in her bed. Oh, that rhymes. Ah. I'm sorry. <laughs>